being human. And I think on a very deep psychological level, light is this way in which we experience the energy surrounding us in a very personal manner. My name is Matt Dilling. I'm the founder of Lightbright Neon Studio, and we manufacture, produce, and restore neon works of art and design. Origins of the creative content of a lot of the work at Lightbright comes from a variety of sources. Sometimes people come with a napkin sketch, some people come with an Adobe Illustrator file, and we have a whole design team who then we kind of work together to help create layouts of what it might look like. Scale it up and create a paper template using a pen plotter. And that paper template actually becomes our guide for what we're going to bend the neon to. We take from the office into the glass shop. We pick out the right size tubing with the right color for the right size project. From there, we heat up the glass tubing. The torches heat the glass well in excess of a thousand degrees in order for it to get into its molten state. We heat up and bend the glass tubing to match the template. One of our chandeliers has over a hundred different bends in it. So each one of those bends has to be marked for a heated up bend. We also have to allow the glass to cool between the bends so that the next area can be worked on and heated up in its own unique fashion. It turns into spaghetti, and then we have to make sure that that spaghetti lines back up and cools to the template. If we use a blow hose to connect our mouth to the tube, create a volume that's closed and we can control the pressure in there with our mouth. There's just a variety of challenges that come up inherently in working with glass. Glass can crack due to stress. And sometimes you'll just have a batch that all it wants to do when it gets near a torch is crack. After we've bent various components, we have to go in using the crossfire or the hand torch and actually weld all of those pieces together. The last step on that is then to weld on electrodes onto either end. Each one of those steps is very, very specific. I draw inspiration from so many different experiences. It's hard to come up with one thing that's particular, but one of the ways that I really am able to connect with the creative is to float. Floating is a similar experience to meditation, to psychedelics, going into a blackened room and laying out in a body of water and salt that's heated to your body temperature and it allows for all sort of external stimulation to fall away. And your internal world really begins to bubble up and manifest. You really get to experience a different relationship to your mind. Once the neon tube is completed, we have to hook it up to our manifold for bombarding. The manifold is open, a vacuum is drawn. We check the tube for leaks with our Tesla coil. We close the tube back off and we heat it up using a very large and powerful transformer. As the tube is heated up, it releases anything that's not inert inside the tube and we evacuate that out. We introduce the gasket into it and we seal the tube off, sealing into that tube whatever gas we introduced into it. I think 
My favorite part of making a neon light is when I see it lit up for the first time. Different gases, when electrified, emit different wavelengths of light. Neon gas is this very bright orange, fiery red color. Argon gas creates a very intense blue. But that light output that is produced can then be expressed in a different wavelength by coating the inside of the tubes with a phosphor coating that takes that one wavelength of light and emits a different wavelength. We bring it over to the aging table where we hook it up to an aging transformer and allow it to settle, age the gas in that we've introduced to it. There's always a stray particle of something left inside the tube. But that time that the oxide coating can act to scrub whatever is left inside the tube while things are getting settled in place. Once the tubes are aged in, we move on to our process of assembling two halves of the fixture together in a jig, gluing up the center of the fixture to its spindle. Once the adhesive dried, we would connect the wires from the fixture together into a transformer, and we turn on power and it lights up. What we love about what we do here is that we try and put out into the world the kind of things that we'd like to see. I still am surprised when it lights up. I'm still excited when I get to see it illuminated. There's an ineffable quality to it. To me, is this insight into the inner workings of the universe. It literally is. It's a way of looking at what is surrounding us in the cosmos in a new light.
bit like an addiction. You've got to make something. You have to do something. It's borderline obsession. And every bike we build is my favourite bike at the time. And as soon as it's done, I want to build another one. Sven Cycles is something I've been thinking about ever since I started cycling in my late teens. We want bikes that ultimately you'll really enjoy riding. There's never a bike that's the same. There's always a slight change. And as we build them individually as well, they have the marks of a bike that's built by hand. Most people I know cycle have an idea of their dream bicycle. And it may be an evolving idea you've had in your head. And we've worked with a lot of people that have come to us with sketches and scrapbooks. It's really, really nice to build something that's just one-off and unique. I think a lot of people see a bicycle as two wheels and a frame in the middle. There are a lot of subtle changes and nuances in design that which can change the riding characteristics quite dramatically. I'm a really big fan of modernist architecture and the simplicity of a modernist building is really hard to achieve. And with some of our bikes, they may look very simple, but I think people should not underestimate the time and effort that goes into designing a product. Tubing is key to a bike's feel and ride. Reynolds tubing has been in my life ever since I can remember. Growing up, I could never afford a frame manufactured with their tubing. We can now put a badge on our bike saying manufactured in Reynolds, which is a sort of thing as a kid I just wouldn't have believed was going to happen. Every part of the bike has a specific tube. It's not universal. The first thing we do is get the tubes out, check they're correct, check the wall thicknesses, sand the edges, make sure it's all really clean, because if it's not clean, the tubes won't join together correctly. We build in steel because I still believe it's one of the best materials to use. It's been used in bikes since the late 1800s, and they're still using it now for a very good reason. It's the flexibility that we can replace the tube, repaint the bike, and you wouldn't know it's damaged. I just like working with it. It's very sculptural. This isn't sort of aerospace precision engineering. It's a steel rule and a marker. So when we're cutting the tubes, it's within a mill or two. But what we're trying to do is take the best from bicycle building in the past and add a little bit of modern flair to it. There's various techniques for building bicycles. We do a thing called fillet brazing, where you connect a pipe together. We use a bronze rod and a flame. We heat the tubes up to the same temperature and we fill the joint with bronze. And it gives a very, very sort of fluid, lovely, sort of quite sculptural feel. It's got to practice. You've got to be able to judge material temperatures. You've got to just look at it and you just get a feel for it. It's the stage where your tubes start to look a bit like a bicycle. My father's a jeweler. He'd make sort of very pretty things which are lovely, but for me, they don't really have any function. What I love about bicycles, you can start on a Monday with a box of tubes, you can be riding it by the weekend, and it can last you for the rest of your life. Outside of the frame and forks, the other most important part is the wheels and tyres. When you build the wheel, you have to lace them, so there's little holes going all the way around the rim. You poke the spoke through. We do build all our wheels by hand here because a machine can't get 30 years worth of wheel building experience. Colour is very, very personal. With any of our bikes, you can have them painted whatever colour you want. We match one to the teapot so we can get that scanned and we can match that or someone's favourite item of clothing. I like to let the bike sit for four or five days minimum just so the paint can have time to cure a little bit and then we assemble it. We get out all the new components and it's a case of putting them together. Some bikes you can assemble in three hours, some will take three days. And we've built bikes that cost in the £10,000 plus mark. Some people, they're saving up and this is their bike and they're going to own it for the rest of their lives. So we just want to make sure they get the right thing. time I had some freedom so as soon as I had one I was off. 
lot of people still get that thrill as when they were a kid blasting down a hill, wind going through their hair. It's fun. Yeah, everyone has their favorite jacket or something that just makes them feel good. If you've got a bike that fits well, you actually feel part of it. Building bicycles as a creative outlet is fantastic. It's not something you do because you're gonna get a big paycheck at the end of the day. You do it for something you have a passion for it. If you ever saw a wooden surfboard, it was probably hanging in somebody's house or underneath the deck. But kind of in the last 10 or 15 years, wood has made a big comeback. They surf wonderfully. It's beautiful and it feels great to be on one of them. I always had a love for wood and kind of passionate about things that went in the water. I've kind of been around wooden boats most of my life. There's just so much character. The way they're built, the stories that come with them, a lot of that has translated over to why we build surfboards the way we do. When we first started thinking about building surfboards, wood was the natural material we chose. They have a very high strength to weight ratio. Wooden surfboards have the longest history of use in the surf world than any other material. People have been surfing wooden surfboards since kind of the first documented history of people riding waves. The board starts in CAD, where we take a 3D model, break down the shape and kind of create frames and templates and all the inner parts of the board that we get cut on a CNC machine. We take those frames and we just pop them out, assemble the frame into kind of a skeleton. 
go out to our lumber shed, pick a bunch of cedar, and bring them into our mill shop, put glue on the edges, clamp it all together into a panel. Everything's book matched. You have symmetry in the colors and texture of the wood. Cut your outline. Take our assembled frame, gently put it down right on top of the plane. Once that foundation is started, you're basically building up the three-dimensional shape, the outside part of the board, using lots of strips that kind of interlock and fit together. Every piece of wood is going to be different, and it's all going to react differently. There are frustrations with it, but I think that's one of the things that keeps it challenging. You learn to read the kind of what the grain lines are doing and what the color of the wood is telling you. those rails are cleaned up we put our top planks on it's a little bit like putting a lid on a box it's like this is it whatever's inside that board is staying inside that board and by tensioning some rope you can clamp the two together it's like a time capsule what makes our boards unique are they are built right here in york they're built using material that grows right here in the state of maine they're built 100 percent by hand by local craftspeople and surfers there is a lot of time that goes into these boards, between 40 and 60 hours start to finish. We wanted to build surfboards that were as hollow as they could be, but still be strong enough to work well. Too light and they don't surf well, but too heavy and they don't surf well. So there's a, there's a balance point there, and that's where we try to be. Taking the board off the rocker table once the top has gone on, that is by far one of my top favorite parts. It's just you and a shaping stand, a board, and a hand plane. Everything else is out of your view. It's simple, it's pleasurable, it's quiet. You can be with your thoughts and you can just kind of be present. There's something about taking a nice sharp edge tool to a beautiful piece of wood and feeling the curls coming off and knowing that every pass that you're making, you're kind of getting it closer and closer to what you have in mind. Once we've shaped it down and the board's looking like it's supposed to look like, time for it to go into the glassing room. Four ounce fiberglass, laying it over the board, draping it over the edges, cutting it, applying epoxy, and on the board. Once both sides are lamb coated, it's time to put in the hardware. Drill and router and install the fin box. And on the other side, we drill and put in the leash plug and a vent. There's a lot of air just naturally inside the board, and that air wants to expand and contract with temperature changes. And that vent has a little piece of Gore-Tex fabric in it, and it allows air to kind of breathe both ways, but it doesn't allow water to get in. Once all that hardware is put in, it goes back into the glassing room. We brush a nice, beautiful, thick coat of epoxy over the whole surface, and that we call a gloss coat. That's supposed to look beautiful and glossy and shiny and flawless you get to see that board come to life. Whatever the colors in the wood, they really come out. It just makes it look like candy. You just want to touch it and run your hands down it, and it's just kind of the icing on the cake. Once everything is hard, we put it into what we call the oven, get that epoxy to cure, really kind of bake it, and just get it to harden. Put in the fin, screw in the vent, and ship it out. We just love the idea of building something that's sustainable and long-lasting and made by hand. Kind of gives you a deeper connection to the product over something you might buy on a shelf. When a customer gets the board, they feel it. They 100% feel the amount of work and the amount of passion that went into the board. So I'm not really looking at hours and efficiency. We're looking at like doing it right and uh, enjoying it as we go.
Ma Baoli, better known as Gang La, is one of the four Grand Marshals leading New York's Pride Parade this year. But in the country he comes from, being gay is still a social taboo. The CEO of a Beijing-based internet company is on a mission to improve the lives of millions of gay men in China. Ma's company Blue City runs an app and a website specifically for gay men. Blue is one of the biggest gay social networking apps in the world, with an estimated 30 million registered users. Unlike most other apps, Blue is more than just dating or hookups. 找他自己的情感，然后可以阅读相关的内容，然后可以进行一些娱乐，比如玩游戏啊，比如看直播啊等等。Back in 2000, when Ma studied at a police school in northern China, he realized he didn't feel like everyone else. 因为他们都找女朋友，然后谈恋爱，但是我对长得好看的同性的男生，我反而觉得对我更有吸引力。after visiting some foreign websites with different attitudes to homosexuality, Ma created his own site for a Chinese audience, encouraging people that even though attitudes towards homosexuals are slowly changing in China, it's still a social stigma. The virtual world of Blued, where members can be open about their sexuality, is for most a striking contrast to their real lives. This is live streaming, a function added to Blued in late 2015, right as the internet craze was starting to take off in China. Many self-made stars like Jin make decent amounts of money by receiving audiences' virtual currencies and gifts. <coughs> Kyle and Klaus, a couple who have come out, live streaming on Blued means something different. The government's rules for acceptable content online may shift quickly in China, with LGBT material in a grey area. Many companies feel the chill of the recent internet crackdown, but Blue City still runs as usual. Ma has won the Chinese government's trust by helping with HIV prevention among gay men. A third of the company's staff are dedicated to screening pornographic and politically sensitive content. In the past five years, Blue City has grown from a team of seven people a promising business with about 250 staff. Ma said the company earned over 15 million US dollars last year, mainly through advertising and selling virtual currencies to live streaming audiences. Now the company is expanding overseas. I hope
is Rich Jiga. He's a Chinese rapper by way of Indonesia, and he's very popular on the internet. This is Joji. He's a Japanese-Australian singer, and he's also very popular on the internet. Plus, Joji invented the Harlem Shake meme. Let me say that again. This guy, Joji... I'm placing a stop on profit for Euro at 116.22. Stop on profit placed at 116.22. Okay. Primarily create content combining Asian culture and hip hop, a formula that apparently pleases the internet gods greatly. They've only been around for 18 months, but they're already putting up major label numbers. I think that we have an unprecedented collective of talent, a group of like predominantly Asian artists, you know, really like making waves globally, which um, from an independent point of view as well. 88's founder, Sean Miyashiro, cut his teeth launching Vice's electronic music channel, Thump. But quickly, Sean became interested in life beyond dance music. I knew that after launching a whole content platform that I have kind of the ability and the know-how to, to, to do it again, but like for what was the question. So Sean moved to the Bronx to start over and figure it out. He couldn't afford an office space, so he worked out of his car at the top of a grimy parking garage. Everything kind of started here. If you look around, this is my environment. This is my, this is my serenity, really, really. 88 Rising was built here. Built on the grounds of uh, LA Fitness residence uh, in a uh, parking garage. I was living in the Bronx. So I'm just like, damn, where the hell do I go? So I just come up here and I like, you know, I just kind of figure things out every single day. Being like, okay, what the hell is this thing? <laughs> Coming here was kind of like my own kind of private office, basically. Like, to be honest, I would even go to the bathroom here. I would, like, take pisses here, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it was, you know, it's it just too far to go back down there. When I need Wi-Fi, I'd spend a good part of the day at Dunkin' Donuts. Hi, how are you? Can I get a, a chicken snack wrap? Before 88 Rising officially launched, Sean caught a surprise break in the form of a Twitter friendship with a funny 16-year-old kid from Indonesia named Brian, who taught himself English by watching Rubik's Cube tutorial videos on YouTube. Seriously, that's true. I thought his Twitter was genius from the future, just crazy. And like, just the shit that he was saying, like the memes he was making. Position closed. On the euro at 116.22, we have another 200 pounds in profit. That stick was Brian's first ever attempt at making a rap song, and it immediately went viral. Everything was great about it, but the one thing that I noticed is the song was hard as hell. Just like everything about it, man. Just like, um, it was menacing, bro. Soon after the video dropped, Brian signed with 88 Rising. I'll FaceTime with Rich. Sorry for calling you Rich Shiga on my phone, Rich. He gets, I mean, Brian, he gets like super pissed off that he saved in my phone as Rich Shiga. He's like, dude, am I not, am I not a human to you? What's good, bro? What's good, brother? How you doing? Doing great. How was it? It was tight. So, Brian could definitely rap. But some viewers understandably took offense at a Chinese kid satirizing rap cliches and calling himself Rich Shiga. But if a group of well-known rappers saw the video and genuinely liked it, that could at least help validate Brian as a legit hip-hop artist. Plus, it could be really funny. It was just a kind of an idea that kind of I, I just had on the spot. Everything that rappers say is better and funnier and smarter and wittier. You know, it's just more entertaining. So we just edited it as tight as possible, put it up, and uh, 
It really worked. Woo! Yo, this nigga got a pouch on and a Reebok pouch. This is the hardest nigga of all time. You said when you come for a chicken like me. That was dope. Like, it's just lit, and I think people will take it as a people will take it as a joke at first, but it's like if he ran with that and kept doing more videos like that, it's just lit. You know, I have never been to America before and like all of a sudden it's like I see like all the rappers that I listen to just like reacting to my stuff and I was like, What? How did this happen? The reaction video also went viral and even led to a remix of Dat Stick featuring Wu Tang's Ghostface. I'll get on that track. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> really? On the remix? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you got it. Oh, you don't have And yeah, the remix went viral too. Brian has since acknowledged the misstep in his name and claims he may change it. But for the time being, he's still Rich Chiga to his fans. An ever-growing global audience, hungry for more releases from emerging talent around the world. I didn't know that it was going to going to be this impactful and this important to people and I'm I'm very thankful and blessed that it has and every day now that you know I wake up it's it's like you know it's just like a new mission every day a major part of that mission involves Joji remember the bloody bath guy he's a former YouTube personality in the middle of a career transition the sound of, of this this song will he is it's like a trap song that you can like slow dance to Awkward prom shit. You know what I mean? I used to do crazy uh, episodic uh, internet videos. It was going well, and one day it was me. It was me and a, a few friends just in a room. We were we were casually chilling, and then someone plays the song, and it's it's brand new at the time. I happened to have a lot of costumes laying around, so I told the other guys, I was like, get in these costumes and let's just dance to it. Like, who cares? We were like, okay, let's let's just go crazy at the drop. So that video goes up. I go to sleep. And the next morning, everyone's doing it. Like, next morning. That taught me a lot about the internet, how people want to just be a part of something. And from that point on, something changed and I was a little better at understanding demographics and people and you know what they want to see and what they want to hear. I was friends with uh, a couple other artists who were affiliated with 88 and then I also started to realize that 88 is is the, the bridge uh, between Western and, and, and Asian entertainment and I really wanted to be a part of that. Joji just released the In Tongues EP, his first project as a serious artist. Joji's In Tongues record came out a couple weeks ago. Um, it's number two on Billboard on the R&B charts, which is crazy for, you know, independent release. I'm placing a new order to buy at 116.19. New order place to buy euro at 116.19. Okay. Tonight, Rich Chiga has a show in New York City. Tickets sold out in an hour. I came here, I'm first on line. I, I came here at one. Yeah, I was the third person on line. So why'd you get here so early? Because I'm going to see Rich Chiga. I want to touch him. him. <laughs> what are you guys thinking of Joji? He's oh my god! That's my dad, son. Do you guys cop the new EP? Or like yeah. yeah. I woke up at 6 in the morning just to pop this shit. And then I listened to it, and that shit started making me cry. <laughs> this is actually kind of exciting. Every time, this never gets old. Like, you live online and social media, but like, there's nothing like just being with the people.
More often than not, viral success happens by accident. And then after an appearance on Ellen or Jimmy Kimmel, the creator's star power fizzles out. But Idiot Rising has figured out how to turn potential gimmicks into brands with an actual following that keeps coming back for the next thing. Oh, shit! <laughs> so keep an eye out for Idiot's next move. But more than likely, it won't be covered on network television or terrestrial radio. Although, as they've already proven, nowadays that really doesn't matter. I opened new position for euro at 116.19. Okay, new position opened for euro at 116.19. Online retailer Farfetch is betting it can shape the future. This is its concept store showcasing the latest in retail tech. How do you capture all of that fantastic information that you gather in store with customers, touch and feel products? And we created a concept called the Connected Rail. And this is using a combination of RFID and ultrasound. The RFID signal uh, recognizes the product and the ultrasound recognizes the movement. Take the product off and then you'll start to see your products appear. And essentially it's like online browsing behavior. Whichever products you touch and pick up in the store are automatically sent to your app. This is effectively what you've created is your in-store wish list. In the middle you'll see essentially a hologram of the product. What the customer sees, they, they control the experience on um, a touch device. What this allows the customer to do is take uh, elements of products and then add their own style to it.
Right, so this is the connected mirror. So in this example, I see my products. I select a coat, and that's tried it, and it's slightly too big for me. So what I can do is choose an alternative size and send a request to the sales associate, and they'll bring that size to me in the fitting room mirror. You'll also see that we've got some product recommendations here. Crucially, the sales associate's able to push items into the mirror from their device. If you wanted to, you could simply use the mirror and pay and go. Your items would then be packed and dispatched to you afterwards. Do you want me to turn you so you're looking outwards? Yes, please. Yes, please? How about that? First time we came out with B, Jade said, it feels like I've been released from prison. Do you want these, missus? Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> right. Yeah. If she could say hello to everybody, people she hadn't seen for months. It's Jade. Oh, it's Jade. So you can talk to Jade for a bit. Hi, Katie. She's there. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Every time anyone's seen her, they want to know why she's there. And it's kind of the opposite of when you're in a wheelchair and people see you and they kind of go, oh, um, should I look? I don't know. I don't know what the right protocol is. When there's a tiny robot with its bright little eyes going around just looking happy everywhere, um, it really opens you up for conversation. You've got some friends here, look. <laughs> Hiya. When I saw her for the first time, I remember thinking, this is going to change things. This is one of those points where if this was a book, this would be the cliffhanger.
condition called Ellis Danlos syndrome, um, which means that I have a lot of dislocations, there's a lot of pain, um, and a lot of seizures and whatnot. So I can end up um, on my own in my room uh, for long periods of time. A lot of the time, um, with a condition like my own, of course there's the pain, and the pain is bad, and the dislocations are bad, and the seizures, and being in paralysis, and never knowing whether you're going to be able to wake up properly tomorrow, that's bad. But what's worse still is being able to count the number of people you see a day on one hand. Are you ready? Sure am, I'm just hoping the connection's going to stay. Yeah, me too. Alright, here we go. When you used to just the same little metre by metre and a half window every day, and you've been there for months, being able to just see the sky from somewhere else, or the tops of trees, or a sign, is incredible. Or being able to have that kind of chat in the car that most people will probably take for granted. I'm going to go past Grandma and Granddad so you can give them a wave. Now, if Jade is particularly seizure she um, can still take part, um, and that's brilliant, really, because before she would just be left um, in in a bed or in the house with just her carers. It's quite a small world, that. Right, so there's one of them. Uh, here, this, this costume I'm busy making at the moment. When I'm not on bed rest and I'm not just um, wearing pyjamas all the time, um, I enjoy uh, being able to dress as different characters and go to comic cons and that kind of thing um, because it just lets me show a different side of myself um, and it's a, it's a bit of fun. If you can't go out that often, you've got to enjoy it when you do. <laughs> Was that? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> it's one of those weird things where I want to not have to use B because I want to be well enough to be able to go to those places myself. Like, it really makes a big difference to me to be able to go into school. But the thing is, with my condition fluctuating all of the time, I can't go into school reliably. And it's brilliant because I can really tell the difference between today and yesterday. Um, how yesterday I forced myself to go into school when I wasn't very well and I was really tired afterwards and ended up having loads of seizures. Whereas today I've been able to do all of the work, I've been able to keep a clear head and not be ill, which means I'm able to be more focused on my schoolwork. So there is my first step of working is to simplify the eight. The algebra test is next week. Now I'm trying to make friendships which I'll be able to maintain with B. Before that, I end up letting people down quite often. B gives me hope, yeah. She's just always there. And if I can't do something, she can. And if I need sort of assistance to be able to make commitments, then she's there and she means that I feel like a more valuable person because I'm more reliable.
when it debuted, the 4G wireless we have today allowed people for the first time to hit the road and explore unknown places with only a smartphone for directions. When 5G arrives, it could enable driverless cars to take us there as well. 5G stands for 5th Generation Mobile Networks or Wireless Systems. It's insanely fast and can accommodate a lot more connected devices. But the reason it's being called revolutionary is because 5G will allow connected devices to speak to each other as well as people. Right now we're living in a world where really it's, it's a one-way experience. That's Bloomberg tech reporter Ian King. The network talks to your phone, you look at your phone and access data, then you send something back to the network. What we're being told about 5G is that really for the first time we're going to see machines communicating with each other over mobile networks in a meaningful way. 5G could end up being 100 times faster than what we have now, with speeds that could reach 20 gigabits per second. In plain English, that means downloading a full-length HD movie in seconds. 5G will also increase total bandwidth, which we will need in order to accommodate the growing Internet of Things. We're talking about the class of devices like internet-connected refrigerators, thermostats, dog collars, but 5G will enable many, many more. Things like your utility network factories, where machines are just sat there, not connected at all. Suddenly, well, they're all going to be connected. Suddenly, we're going to be able to have real-time monitoring. Other things like cars, like uh, utility poles, like your light, you know, the, the light poles. But perhaps the biggest advance will be a huge reduction in communication lag time, known as latency. A network of driverless cars will need the speed of 5G to ping each other multiple times per second to avoid collisions. Near instantaneous data transfers could allow doctors to perform surgery remotely with a robotic scalpel. So how will all this work? First, you need to improve network density. And that's just a fancy way to say you put more towers out there. What we're being told is that's not actually the case with 5G. The idea is 5G will not only use the existing mobile spectrum, but also tap into higher frequencies called millimeter waves. Millimeter waves can carry more data, but only travel short distances. This may mean you'll see a lot more of these base stations around town. And the new towers may have as many as 100 antenna ports, compared to about a dozen on 4G cell towers. So when will we get 5G? Getting 5G ready is expected to cost providers $275 billion over seven years in the U.S. alone. Look for the first 5G service to pop up in big cities sometime in 2019.
The cubicle represents a tyranny that it confines your imagination, your thoughts, into a small physical area. Imagine pretty much every software engineer or finance person being able to you know, disconnect from their desk and look at holographic monitors on a beach and doing their work from there. That's not going to be science fiction. It's the modern office place. Silicon Valley is all about building the future. A startup called Meta thinks it's getting there first, thanks to a big bet that it's made on augmented reality. How are you? Good, thank you. Welcome to Meta. Thank you. Call it a 360 degree office where you can spatialize your thoughts as part of your workflow for education, architecture, design, engineering, etc. People often mix up augmented reality with virtual reality. VR totally blocks your ability to see or hear the real world. AR overlays holograms onto what you already see. Meta has tried to make its version of the workspace feel familiar. You grab the hologram instead of using a controller or a mouse, and your brain already knows how to do it. In other words, we've designed an operating system that humanity has always known how to use. So you can see this eyeball, which is, by the way, photorealistic. You can see my hand is occluding the eyeball, and now the eyeball is occluding my hand, right? You see those two circles? They get small, and then they turn into this glowing white ball, and then I can move my hand around supernaturally. I can do this with two hands and rotate the thing. I could stretch it. I could throw it back right into the shelving system, and that's all you have to learn to become a modern worker. And to prove this, the employees at Meta have started to get rid of their computer monitors trading them in for Meta's augmented reality headsets. Mirone thinks that in less than a decade, we'll all be just wearing strips of glass that can project holograms. In the early 80s, everybody had computers on their desktop, but no one was using them because they had a lot of work to do. So they were still using typewriters. And at some point, the CEO took all the typewriters away and everybody was forced to use their computers so it's very exciting to see a new generation of technology a new paradigm i consider us like pioneers in the holographic wild i'm pulling up my browser with my hands and I'm sending out emails to colleagues and just kind of really acclimating to the new environment digital lives live on our phones. We have all of our pictures and notes and all these kinds of things. So why don't you write yourself a little sticky note? I like it. And go ahead and just take your fist right over the top of the sticky note and close your fist. And now... Oh, what? Meta's own transition to augmented reality has run into plenty of unexpected problems. And it's still going to be a while before you'll start to see these devices in your office but I think it's a future worth waiting for. If we could see these holograms between us, we will have been able to share our work with one another more naturally, more efficiently, and more productively than ever before. Humanity will have evolved slightly.
This is Hatsune Miku, Japan's sensational virtual pop star. She's released over 100,000 songs in multiple languages and performed sold out concerts around the world. Her image has appeared in games, on TV, in car races, and is even etched on the side of a Japanese space rocket. I came from Hatsune Miku, Carlos. She's Lady Gaga's favorite digital pop star and opened shows for her in the US three years ago. Tens of thousands of fans attended her exhibition and live shows near Tokyo recently. She's everything to everybody. That's probably why she's so popular. Miku's creator, Hiroyuki Ito, and his Sapporo based company have been developing the virtual diva for over 10 years. Both the software and character are named Hatsune Miku, meaning the first sound of the future. Originally based on Yamaha's Vocaloid technology, Miku the software has a sound bank containing voice samples and a huge array of tools. You input the melody and lyrics, then Miku the character sings them. To date, Krypton has sold 120,000 software licenses at $200 each to fans around the world who use it to create numerous songs and share them online. Some of the fan-created songs are chosen to be part of Miku's concerts, for which they're paid a royalty fee. The company also has other revenue streams. It makes money from merchandising, licensing deals, and concert ticket sales. According to the real-life musicians who perform with Hatsune Miku, the virtual pop star is interesting and surprising. Well, I'm placing another stop on profit for Euro. This time it will be 116.21. Okay, stop and profit. And for her fans, it goes even further.
Now, there are a lot of fitness gadgets out there. In my quest to get fit, I tested 17 of them over the last few months. At least one personal trainer I know was a little bit skeptical. Yeah, I've been watching these new technologies come to the market for almost as long as I've been a personal trainer. They're just tricks and tropes. They're not much different than the Bowflex machines or, to be honest, the original Jane Fonda workout video. But some of these gadgets that are just coming to the market do so much more than what they used to do, just tracking your activities. Out of all of them, this chest strap was my favorite. It comes with a robot coach that points to the future, one where you might not need a human trainer at all. And it works like this. You wear the chest strap so that it can read your heart rate, and that connects to Move's free app that talks to you. Welcome to Move Heart Rate Hit Outdoor Running. Let's get moving and warm up in zone two. Move's computerized coach tells you what to do at that exact moment, whether you're running outside or you're doing body weight exercises indoors. Swing your arms faster to get your legs moving quicker. Let's crush this round. And by reading your heart rate, she knows exactly how hard you're working. She keeps you honest. Way to go, you are in the target zone. Keep pushing, you're almost at the end of the round. Don't give up. I've been running for seven years now, and my biggest problem is that I never push myself hard enough. I end up going on the same slow, comfortable 30-minute jog, but the Move HR Burn blasted me out of that rut. By the end of these half-hour exercises, I was drenched in sweat in a way that I never am when I work out alone. Training with a real person is great, whether that's your group instructor or your coach or your personal trainer, but humans, they're expensive. For the rest of us, this $60 gadget is all you need.
What does it take to change the world? A big army? A cure to a pandemic? A revolution? All of these take either a lot of people, thousands of hours, or massive amounts of space. But for Julian Assange, all he needs is one room, an internet connection, and the world will listen. Assange is located here, and more specifically, right here. And from that location, he's posted government secrets, classified documents, and leaked emails from some of the world's most powerful people. And in doing so, has been labeled a hero, a villain, a... I closed another position on the euro at 116.21, another 200 pounds in profit. 1971 in Townsville, Australia, Assange has always been on the move. Living in over 30 homes by the time he was in his mid-teens, Assange, along with his mother and half-brother, finally settled down in Melbourne. His introduction to hacking started at 16 when he was given a Commodore 64, which he attached to a modem. He attended the University of Melbourne, where he studied programming, physics, and mathematics. He never graduated, but that doesn't mean he didn't get an education. By 1991, Assange hacked into the Pentagon, U.S. Navy, and other branches of the U.S. government. In 1996, he was caught by the Australian Federal Police and charged with over 30 counts of hacking and computer-related crimes. He didn't get any jail time, but he was fined $2,100. I think the first taste of what would come later was the hacking that he did as a young programmer, and that really sort of foreshadowed a healthy skepticism of the use and abuse of technology by governments. That's Vernon Silver. I'm a reporter for Bloomberg's investigations team. Assange's youth as a hacker laid the foundation for him to start WikiLeaks in 2006. But what is WikiLeaks? It's a website that posts unfiltered, usually classified documents. What separates it from every other media outlet is that they have no editorial hierarchy. With a publication like the New York Times, information comes in, they take that information, package it, then disseminate it for the public to see. WikiLeaks, however, cuts out the middleman. WikiLeaks gathers information, most of it given to them anonymously. So what they're doing is really very simple. They get the information in one end from who gives it to them and out the other with sometimes minimal interference. Julian Assange is the leader of that, the mastermind, the creator, and really because he thinks of it as a journalistic enterprise, the editor-in-chief. But every story starts with a source, and Assange has some unconventional sources. Julian Assange does not hack as far as we know. He is the recipient of people who are either insiders who give him secret documents or hack emails from a foreign power. That's Eli Lake. I am a columnist for Bloomberg. And there was no source bigger for Assange than Chelsea Manning. He used to be known as U.S. soldier Bradley Manning. In 2010, Manning provided Assange and WikiLeaks with hundreds of thousands of leaked government documents. WikiLeaks quietly began releasing the documents in February of 2010 then made big headlines in April by posting what is now known as the collateral murder video. Come on, fire! It was a vivid, graphic video. It changed the debate on the Iraq war, and importantly, it put WikiLeaks on the map when they put it online, and they couldn't be ignored at that point. And those leaks were just the beginning. They went on to post more than 90,000 leaked documents known as the Afghan war logs, 390,000 documents known as the Iraq war logs, and a quarter of a million private messages between diplomats called cables in what is now known as Cablegate. These leaks were met with very real ethical questions. The problem with publishing those cables was that a number of confidential sources for U.S. diplomats could face real danger when their names were exposed. Then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton drove the point home that every country, including the United States, must be able to have candid conversations about the people and nations with whom they deal. Shortly after Cablegate, the Swedish government issued an arrest warrant for Assange on allegations of rape and molestation. He claimed the allegations were fabricated to get him extradited to the United States, a claim the U.S. government denied. Either way, Assange's next move was to seek refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, which really was the beginning of the new chapter in his life and what we're dealing with now, which is him being stuck in London. What was supposed to be an office in an embassy is now Assange's self-imposed prison to this very day. But that doesn't mean he's slowed down. Since being trapped in the embassy, WikiLeaks has released files about Guantanamo Bay prisoners, Syrian political figures, and the draft to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And then came the 2016 U.S. election. Thousands of leaked emails show Democratic Party officials possibly plotting against Bernie Sanders in his race against Hillary Clinton. 
Over the course of 68 days, WikiLeaks released 20,000 confidential Democratic National Committee emails. In terms of the presidential race, if you look right here, when Assange released the first batch of emails, Trump actually takes his first lead against Clinton. I think we've had enough of the Clintons in all fairness. Once WikiLeaks started exposing secrets of the Democratic Party, Julian Assange became a hero to many on the right. Public opinion kind of flip-flopped. WikiLeaks! From the emails, we now know Hillary Clinton's campaign manager makes risotto, and also how the DNC squashed Bernie Sanders' campaign. One thing we don't know is who gave Assange the stolen emails in the first place. Many leading Democrats say they suspect it was the Russians. They released an analysis from a private cybersecurity firm that had said it was the Russians. But Assange claims... Our source uh, is not the Russian government, uh, and it is not a state party. So this is where we stand today. The public still doesn't know who provided the emails to WikiLeaks. Meanwhile, Assange is still running WikiLeaks and still releasing documents. In March 2017, he started publishing documents from the CIA's Center for Cyber Intelligence called Vault 7. The CIA, the agency charged with finding and keeping our top secrets, can't keep its own secrets. As long as Assange has a connection to the world, no government secret will be too far from exposure. Julian Assange is still in the embassy. Maybe he'll leave, maybe he won't. Kind of regardless, his work has been done. He's changed the way people think about their governments, about their own secrets, about their own hackability, and really the world has changed because of him. everything you won't admit and action this entire video is based on a true story when i do like motivational speeches or even tell myself like, love yourself and you should love yourself this is lily singh 
but to fans all over the world, she's the YouTube star Superwoman. What if everyone wants a girl? Superwoman. I know we can change the world for the better one positive day at a time. My parents now know what I do. <laughs> they didn't know what I did for a long time in the beginning of my career. I was just making videos in my room. They had no idea. Mom, Dad, have you seen my keys? I can't find them anywhere because you're always on phone. Until someone called them, like a family member from another part of Canada was like, Canada, is your daughter making videos? And her mom was like, I don't, I don't know, Lily or Lily, are you making videos? Just making videos grew into an entire career. Today, Lily's YouTube channel has some 12 million subscribers, over 2 billion views, and guest stars like Michelle Obama, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and Seth Rogen. I think a lot of young girls are raised to believe that you're gonna go to school and then graduate and then get married and then get a job and have kids. And Lily was on that path, all the way through a psychology degree at York University in Toronto. But when she started thinking about a career... I started to immensely panic and think something was wrong with me because I tried to figure out my life and it wasn't working in that straight line. It was 2010 and YouTube was only five years old. I thought nothing of YouTube. I, I was probably the last person in my circle of friends to discover YouTube. And I remember when I did, I thought, this is so strange. There's people making videos in their rooms and other people are watching them. So she figured, why not give it a shot? I one day posted a video because I was sad and I wanted to be creative and happy. She didn't know how to edit video or write scripts, so she winged it. It was so bad and so cringe, and my expectation was literally nothing. I was like, I'm gonna put this video up, a couple of my friends are gonna watch it, probably make fun of me, and that's gonna be the end of this. The second and third video came from, wait, 70 people watched my first one, can I get 80 to watch the next one? She kept creating, she kept posting, and the viewers kept coming. Lily had found an audience. A lot of the comments were, oh my God, there's a brown girl on YouTube. More specifically, Indian. Lily's parents immigrated to Canada from India, and Lily was born and raised in Scarborough near Toronto. My home life was awesome. My parents, even though I portrayed them to be quite strict in my videos. Oh, you mean, wear the rest of your scarf, huh? I teach you like this, walk around like this, showing everything to everyone. They actually aren't like that at all. They're pretty modern and pretty cool. Your dress is short. Don't know what for. And we're pretty lenient with me. I mean, I got to, I got away with a lot of things. I was a brat. This is this is the, I was a brat. She had a different idea of what she wanted out of life than other kids. In a grade school graduation slideshow, her classmates said they wanted to be lawyers and doctors. And then I came up and I was like rapper. Looking out with your friends, man. Yeah. But then you say that you hate home. I could just feel my parents being like, why? <laughs> Because that's just not something women really did in the Singh family. I know there was a ton of people that weren't happy about my birth being a female, so I think, and that's some real-ish, but it's, it's, it's a real thing. The best thing I could have done to prove to so many people that didn't want my mom to have a daughter was to become Superwoman. What if everyone is a girl, Superwoman? It was the name of Lily's favorite hip-hop song by Lil Mo featuring Fabulous. I love the song so much because it was one of the only songs at the time that was an empowering female song where Lil Mo's going on about like, I will save guys with my superpowers and I will save girls with my superpowers and I am Superwoman. I thought, this name that I've had for so long that empowered me when I was younger, I'm gonna make this my screen name. Maybe this should be a new series. Superwoman didn't just burst onto the scene overnight with a viral video. It was a steady climb fueled by hard work. The moment that I thought this is going somewhere and this could be a career was the first time I performed internationally. It was in India. And it was the first time where I was truly across the world and people knew my videos. Singh has transformed herself from a bratty kid to an internet personality to a media mogul. She starred in a feature film, A Trip to Unicorn Island, in 2016. And her book, How to Be a Boss, hit the New York Times bestseller list in 2017 while she was on a 30-city international tour. Lily started out with the goal of getting millions of subscribers and financial security. Hurry the hell up! But after surpassing those goals, success has new meaning. I really come to terms with the fact that my, my definition of success is what's the best legacy I can leave behind. And it's not the number of views, the number of subscribers. It is the number of people that can say, this girl changed my life or changed something in my life positively.
is often found in the brains of deceased athletes, military veterans, and others with a history of repetitive brain trauma. Hundreds have donated their brains to the VA Boston University Concussion Legacy Foundation Brain Bank. This is a former NFL player who died in his early 70s. And this is a, a veteran uh, who also died in his early 70s. Dr. Ann McKee dissects these brains. The hippocampus and the mammillary bodies are very important for memory. I can see that they're slightly affected. McKee recently dissected the brain of former New England Patriots player Aaron Hernandez, who was convicted of murder and later committed suicide. You'll see right away that the brain is showing signs of shrinkage. You can see the crevices in the brain that you can't see in the normal. McKee says Hernandez's severe case of CTE impacted his decision-making, depression, and ability to control rage and aggression. Right now, she thinks we're underestimating how many people have CTE. We were able to distinguish between CTE and controls and CTE and Alzheimer's disease. The next question is, can we do this in the blood and can we do this in living people? And we aren't there yet with those answers. But the need for a diagnosis in the living is motivating companies such as Quanterix in Lexington, Massachusetts, to work faster on technology that could diagnose concussions and CTE in as few as 30 minutes. Kevin Rosovsky is the CEO. It's like a high-powered microscope. And so by doing that, we can see little biomarkers that you couldn't see before in the blood. Quanterix received a grant from the NFL and just went public. Since then, its stock is up more than 40%. The company sells a machine called Samoa for $175,000 to other biotechs, hospitals, and researchers. And for the first time in history, we're able to see brain health in blood, and that's a major breakthrough, and that's leading to less invasive testing, and we've already been able to see evidence of concussions, and there's the beginning evidence of being able to see the accumulated effect of concussions. Quanterix is also trying to detect Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, and ALS. Rosovsky says he thinks diagnosing concussions will be easier than diagnosing CTE. Diagnosing CT in the living probably is a couple years away. We're real excited to see the progress, but reducing some of that work into actual tests in the laboratory takes time. There's regulatory approvals. There's a lot of um, red tape that you have to go through. Also in this race to diagnose CTE in the blood are Athlon Medical and Exosome Sciences. And New York's Mount Sinai Hospital is scanning for the disease in the living. But it's just one step in a series of questions for those with serious head trauma. There's still no cure for CTE. Even if we had a great idea for a treatment, there's no way to test if, whether it's effective or not. So that's the enormous advance that we'll get if we can develop a biomarker for this disease. In Boston and Mostu, Bloomberg News.
Wine is a $300 billion global industry where one person's opinion can make fortunes or break them. That's because of this man, Robert Parker, and his newsletter, The Wine Advocate. For three decades, he dominated as the world's most influential wine critic. Now Parker's protege is building an empire of his own. Antonio Galloni runs Venice. Antonio, tell me, what are you trying to build at Venice? Well, Venice, we started with the idea in 2013 of building a world-class platform. We have a database of about 250,000 professionally written reviews. On Delectable, we have 7 million user reviews. De through Delectable, we also have a partnership with Whole Foods and several other partnerships that we can't announce just yet. And when you put that all together, what we have is something that no other company in our space can even come close to. Do you think of yourself as the next Parker? Not at all. Why? Uh, because Steve Jobs said you can't live your life trying to be somebody else. So that, he's one of my biggest influences, and I've never wanted to be a replica of somebody else because a replica is never as good as the original. Bob is a, a genius, fantastic, one of a kind. Um, we're going to be something completely different, and I have no, in, no desire to be some version of somebody else. Different in what way? Um, every decision that I've made at this company is completely <laughs> anatomic to what Bob did with his company. Um, I want our writers to be partners. All of my senior people are locked into the company. They all have equity or they have a path to equity based on business results. That's something that we never had at Parker. Our, our benefits are world class, uh, and everything that we've done at Venice is completely different from that model. When Steve Tanzer, who is the most experienced active wine critic in America, wants to work with us, that says something. When Alessandro Masnaghetti, who's the best cartographer of wine vi of, of vineyards, wants to work with us, that says something. When Neil Martin, who's a superstar wine critic with enormous experience in Bordeaux and Burgundy and the former lead critic at The Advocate, wants to come and be part of our team, that says something. You make it sound like The Wine Advocate was a disaster as a company and a miserable experience as an employee. No, it was, it was great because I got to work with Bob Parker when he was at his prime. You know, and Bob was like a second father to me, and we talked on the phone all the time, and he gave me great advice. Can anyone's palate dominate the wine criticism business the way Parker's did? And should anyone's palate dominate it the way his did? I just think the world is very different today. You know, the, I mean, it's just a totally different world. It's probably not healthy to have a single person dominating the world. The, it's not even wine criticism, it's the wine industry. Yeah, it's prob that's probably not the healthiest thing in the world. Um, but I think that there's just such an opportunity right now with social media and technology to reach such a massive number of people that I think it's possible that one or two people will actually have more influence than Bob Parker did. Because they will, they will again, this goes back to your first question, not trying to be a version of somebody else. You see this in sports all the time. It's like, oh, well, nobody will ever beat this record. And then somebody comes along. You know, it was like tennis, Pete Sampras. Nobody's ever going to win as many Grand Slams. Now you have two guys who are ahead of that and one knocking on the door. And, and so I think a lot like that. You're a former investment banker. How does that inform and influence what you're doing and what you've done? My generation has had to deal with a lot more challenges. That's why I think we're actually much better poised for the future. My first job in finance, the first thing that happened was long-term capital, 1998. <laughs> then the tech bubble melted down. Then there was a... Uh, mutual fund trading scandal. You know, that was all like within about five or six years. And these are the things that I had to deal with as a young executive. My peers who were 20 years older didn't know how to manage in crisis. They'd only seen Black Monday. They'd just been in a big bull market. It's very different. So I, I'm very lucky. People of my generation who are a little bit younger have actually had to deal with a lot more crises. I think that's actually good for learning how to cope with challenges in business. From the outside, it kind of looks like you're trying to demolish the house that Parker built, right? You left the wine advocate. Yeah. You merged with one of his chief rivals. Yeah. And you just hired his successor, Neil Martin. Mm -hmm. So are you? I think what that says is that all the best people want to work at our company. And that's really what we strive to create starting in 2013. We wanted to create a world-class company that would attract the best in class talent, and not just on the content side, on the technology side, on the digital side, our office, and at every level, what we're trying to, we only hire superstars, and we're looking for those superstars. Thank you.
In the world of professional wrestling, there's something called a swerve. Hulk Hogan has betrayed WCW! Some examples. These tag team partners are called baby faces, or the good guys. Then one of them swerves when he super kicks his tag team partner in the head, quickly assuming the role of the bad guy, or what the wrestling world calls the heel. Are you kidding? What a despicable act that was! Or a match is almost lost when, what's that? The superstar wrestler appears out of nowhere sprinting down the aisle to save the match. It's the That's a swerve. So it should go as no surprise that World Wrestling Entertainment, known as the WWE, the most popular brand of sports entertainment in the world, is prepared for any swerves that come their way. So here's the story of how the WWE learned to see the swerve coming. So I spoke to Bloomberg reporters Felix Gillette. I'm a writer for Bloomberg News for the Global Business Team. And Kim Bassin. And I'm the U.S. luxury reporter at Bloomberg. To find out exactly how the WWE is positioning itself for an all-out global invasion, which starts with a massive change to their lucrative pay-per-view model. WWE basically pioneered the pay-per-view model on cable. I remember as a kid, when the pay-per-view events came up, all of our friends would scramble around and try and get one of the parents to, to pay for it. But in 2014, they took a huge risk. They saw a little bit sooner than some of the other entertainment brands that where this whole thing was moving was away from cable and satellite television and towards on-demand streaming video apps. They made this risky decision, in essence, cannibalizing that pay-per-view model, which they had essentially built. And after some early turbulence, it's working. Roughly 1.5 million people are paying $9.99 a month for the WWE app, making it the fifth most popular streaming OTT service. This adapt or die approach is in the WWE's DNA. Over the past 30 years, the company always seems to think two steps ahead. In the early 90s, WWE was at its most threatened when Ted Turner took them on with WCW, which stands for World Championship Wrestling. And back then, the WCW was winning the ratings war. So in order to compete with them, WWE had changed its product from a family-friendly kind of cartoonish style to this really raw. That's why they called their show Raw. It was this raw style of, of, of wrestling. With violent, outrageous, reality-inspired plot lines and aggressive personas. From a 16-foot ladder! And they won that fight against Ted Turner. And they bought WCW. The early 2000s ushered in an era of testosterone-driven programming aimed at the red-blooded American male. Bra and panties matches and people smash each other over their head with, with like barbed wire bats and things like that. Until 2015, when WWE fans started a hashtag, Give Divas a Chance. Since then, WWE has hired 40 more female wrestlers, and that growing cast of female characters was part of a much larger plan. They started to try to appeal to a broader set of people. Let's attract more female fans. And after we've attracted more female fans, let's attract more international fans. They're broadening their base, and they're doing that in large part to make it more advertising friendly. And not just friendly to advertisers. They're trying to build up their fan base in China. They're trying to build up their fan base in Europe. They, you know, already have a pretty good fan base in India. India is a place where they already have an established wrestling culture because of the gigantic Indian wrestler, the great Kali. But there's still a lot of work to do. While the WWE set a revenue record in 2017, only 30% of it is coming from an overseas audience. And there's one person whose responsibility is to grow that number. The buck eventually stops at Vince McMahon, no matter what's happening within WWE. Yeah, he's a very controlling guy, and it's a very, very, very tightly scripted company. And that goes all the way down the board to big stars' entrance music. <laughs> and their, their outfits and things like that. So with a CEO like McMahon always planning two moves ahead and an aggressive push into multiple international markets, a big issue is money. It's hard to do all those things simultaneously without 
committing a huge amount of capital to it. And that's where the WWE becomes an attractive company for buyers. Potentially, one thing that could happen with WWE is they could benefit by being acquired by a bigger technology or telecom company, an Amazon or Facebook or a 21st Century Fox. So with a market cap of $2.8 billion, the advantage of owning 100% of their own content and a rapid consolidation spreading throughout the entertainment industry, it looks like the WWE is well positioned, even if there are swerves ahead. Thank you very much for coming here. Thanks for having me. We are, I'm, I've always been relieved ever since you were appointed because at least, until, at, least until, at least until your appointment, I seem to have the most unpronounceable name. But now <laughs> so we will keep it as Dara and John. Where, this conference is called The Year Ahead, but in your case, you are close to six months into the job. And I wondered what you saw in terms of The Year Ahead at Uber as your biggest challenge what, what's the thing that you think about most when well, it comes to 2018 we uh we definitely have our share of challenges yeah. at uber uh and for me where i want to get uber to the year ahead is is a year of normalcy you know 2017 <laughs> was uh i think will go down as one of the most difficult years for any company out there and i have to and i have to give credit to the uber team and the employees there it is a group of true believers who believe in our mission, who believe in mobility as a service being available to consumers everywhere uh, at a reasonable cost. And what my job in 2018 is to, is to get rid of the distractions and get the company back to business 
get the company back to normal. See, there's a lot that we've done in the past six months as far as bringing in new investors, driving a new culture and norms where doing the right thing, period, comes first, uh, bringing in a new management team, et cetera. There's a lot that we've done done, but this is a company that knows how to execute. This is a service. Mobility as a service is something that's universal, that's needed in the world. And I want, and I just want to get back to doing it's business. It's quite interesting. You said true believe, true believers. Yeah. Normally, true believers are the, the last possible people where it's you're able to change a culture. Can you explain a bit about that? Well, I think that they are, uh, they understand that um, mobility is a service, uh, bringing the cost of transportation down, uh, making transportation services available to anyone and everyone on a local basis, and partnering with cities to be a solution to uh, traffic, to pollution, et cetera, that is a mission that they all believe in. Uh, and I think that they, having seen what happened in 2017, to some extent the crisis, the enormous crisis that the company has gone through, is a benefit because everybody at the company knows now that we need to change, that we need to break with the past as far as the way the company was run. We need to go from growth at any cost to responsible growth and, and growth in partnership with other players out there. That's clear, but now I've got to kind of get the uh, company down to the normalcy of execution of building great technology, and I think we're going to get there. It's still some tough sledding early on, but I absolutely think we're going to get there. When you talk about execution, is profits one of the things you want to get? I think you lost $4 billion last year. Well, profits, Pe peanuts by the standards of... Profits would help. <laughs> so, uh, at some point, we absolutely have to become profitable, and that's part you, of the plan. Do you, have a, do you have a kind of goal for that? Do you think that you should be profitable by 2022 or by 2020? I, I think that we'll be profitable before 2022. Uh, this is a, uh, the business itself. Do you, want to, do you want to come back a bit closer, 2020? Or yeah, listen, I'm, it, it's not going to, I don't want to name a specific okay. year, uh, but this is a business that, um, the core business, the ride-sharing business, can be profitable within three years. We will continue to make very aggressive investments in building out autonomy because we think that's a terrific opportunity uh, for building out new technologies such as Uber Elevate where near-term profitability is not, a, uh, is not a goal, but long-term growth is. So we will look to balance near-term profitability, but as a company, we will always be a company that makes big, bold bets and takes big risks. To what extent, though, do you think that drive to become profitable fights against a little bit of this culture change? If you want to make, you talked about making money, but not at all costs. Do, do those two things well, are I, against I, I, I don't think that profitability and culture are their issue. It, it, it's um, it, the, the company in the past was uh, willing to make trade-offs as it related to how it did business, uh, and and I think was 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 guilty of hubris, was guilty of of thinking that they knew better than others, and and I think that what we know now clearly is that breakneck growth can hide uh, uh, cultural issues, uh, that there are no excuses for not doing the right thing, mm -hmm. and that you do have to make trade-offs and and. As a management team, we're specifically talking about those trade-offs that you have to make. Uh, we have to be a little more patient sometimes because working with governments, regulators, et cetera, sometimes takes longer, but in the end, you build a more lasting business. Uh, and so we maybe what we went through was necessary, uh, but we're here. We can control our actions from this moment onwards, and, and I think everyone at Uber uh, from this moment onwards wants to build a great company, not only in terms of growth, but in terms of the kind of company anyone would want to work at. Can I ask you one thing which you have got a sort of hangover from last year, which is the, all, the re all the regulatory problems, and particularly all the, all the cases against you. I think there were six criminal probes or whatever going on. The which, lawyers are lining up outside exactly, the door, which, yeah. which, which, one, which one do you sort of think, which one do you fear most, I suppose, as um, different things? Listen, I think, I, I think that all of them are serious issues. And, and my response is that we're going to be transparent and we're, gonna, we're going to take responsibility for our actions in the past. Um, I do think that the, uh, there are certain circumstances where 
uh, there was smoke but no fire. Uh, and I think as a company, we have to defend ourselves and, and, and work within kind of the appropriate frameworks. And my goal is just to get beyond this stuff. Some of these things like pricing policies, surely they go right to the heart of what Uber is, or am I wrong about that? Yeah, I think they do, but, but I think that there's a way of, of being smart but transparent at the same time, uh, and that's where we've got to take the company. Take me through governments. When you, when you talk to governments privately, do they talk any differently than they do publicly? Governments? Public, yes, governments. Um, I think that they are honestly a, a, a bit relieved with how we are engaging with them because I think I think that the engagement is is now real. I think they feel like uh, we're out there, we're we're genuine because we've learned our lessons of the past, uh, and and I do think that we can take, for example, the data that we have in terms of traffic and in terms of. Uh, movement of our drivers and riders, and we can use that data to partner up with cities uh, in order to solve congestion issues because congestion doesn't help anyone. It wastes enormous amounts of time for consumers. Uh, it, it hurts the environment. Uh, and I think that we are aligned with cities, for example, to partner with them in a fundamental way to solve these problems. And I do think that when th these are conversations that a number of regulators and cities have wanted to have with us for, for many years. And I think we are really engaging with them at a depth uh, that, that I think is, is going to create a real win-win going forward. Do you think you were too confrontational on this before? Yeah, I do. I think that um, uh, the company was, was pushing growth. And li listen, any innovator, to some extent, you, you know, the... the um, innovation is about uh, questioning past uh, kind of present practices. It's about breaking things, the Facebook breaking things. Uh, we just went a step and a half too far. Mm. Uh, and what I want to keep, hopefully, is the best of both worlds, which is this spirit of innovation, the spirit of can do, et cetera, but the responsibility of partnership. We don't know better than you. We're actually going to work with you of actually having dialogue and respect uh, for our city partners, uh, for, for regulators, and then continuing to take risks and continuing to, to do daring things. And I think we can accomplish that. Imagine this, this audience here is a collection of mayors or a collection of city officials, and you want to depict, this is the year ahead conference, yeah. depict what the, the years ahead in this thing are going to be like. How far is driverless cars going to go? You talked just a few days ago about the idea of there being flying cars in 10 years' time. Can you just give a, a description of what you think transport is going to look like? Well, I think that um, the, we, we think there are three keys to transport uh, and, and where the industry is going. Autonomous, electric, and shared. And I think all three are necessary in order to get to, to the next level uh, of city planning, et cetera, up to... There are many cities where up to a fifth of the space taken in these cities is taken by parking and storing these cars. And, and so I do think that you need autonomous, you need electric, and you need shared. And I do think it's going to take some time. Um, true autonomy for every single use case is some ways away. Mm. What we bring to bear is our developing autonomy, and we will have... Uh, autonomous cars on the road, I believe, within the, ne the next 18 months, um, not as a kind of a, a test case, but as a real case out there. And over a period of time, we're going to bring autonomous transportation and feather it in with uh, the non-autonomous transportation with drivers. What's, what's uh, feather, what does feathering in mean feathering to, in mean to mean a layman like me? Mean, uh, Crashing. Uh, yeah, feathering <laughs> in means... Uh, if, if you're, for example, in Phoenix, uh, and you make a request to go from A to B, which is what you do with, with, with uh, Uber, um, there will be 95% of cases where we may not have everything mapped perfectly, or the weather may not be uh, the right weather, or there may be an accident on the, uh, on the road, or you may not have two or three ways of getting from A to B, where you may say, you know what, that's not an autonomous use case. We're going to send a driver to pick that person up. For 5% of cases, everything is going to fall into place. Mm. And we will uh, 
send an autonomous car, the user will be able to pick, do you want, you know, there's an autonomous car, yes or no, uh, and we'll be able to service that A for B. That 5% is going to go to 10 and 15 and 20 as uh, our computers and our algorithms learn more and more about what it takes to drive in a city in a real life situation. Um, and every minute of every day, that driver, that computer, is going to get better and know Phoenix better and better and better. And in five years, uh, we'll have the perfect driver in Phoenix. We will have to retrain that driver in every single city. We're going to have to build out 3D maps of, of these cities. Uh, and it will take time, but over a period of time, you essentially have a driver who becomes the perfect driver. It'll take 10 to 15 years, and, but that's the feathering in that I'm talking about. And will a child born today, will they ever need to learn how to drive? A child born today, no, I don't think so. And so within sort of 20 years from now, we will... I don't think be... so. It, listen, I hear some groans. I know so listen, let, let, uh, I, I heard a couple of groans. 1.3 million people die from car crashes mm. every year. 1.3 million people die from car crashes every year. That doesn't count an estimated 20 to 50 million people that are injured. Okay, this, is, this is actually a public safety issue. Uh, if you look at cars, 96% of cars, 96% of time cars are sitting there not being used. Uh, it is a huge amount of pollution that's, car, that, that, that's caused by these cars being in the road and a huge amount of wasted time. So the safety is there. Electrification is absolutely key, uh, and sharing these platforms is going to allow us to be much safer and also put our assets where they add value. But it's quite interesting because when you first came in, I remember you sounding somewhat more skeptical about self-driving cars. You've been converted. Is that is that a? I uh, the choir has spoken and I'm listening. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's pretty exciting technology out there. But but again. It will be a hybrid technology for some period of time. What about flying cars? That came as a slight surprise. Yes, that's a, uh, that's a great project that we're working on. It's called Uber Elevate. Uh, <laughs> and, and it is actually about battery technology. It would have helped a lot of people here. Um, to I know. I wish, I wish that I was available. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll launch it here if, if we can. Uh, but battery technology is, is allowing us to have multiple uh, rotors on planes. Well, or, or helicopters, if you want to call them that, um, these uh, rotors that are much smaller will be much, much quieter than helicopters are, much quieter, much safer. Uh, if you add sharing into the equation, you can actually get the economics of going from A to B. Uh, we think within five to seven years to a place where normal people would think about taking these flying cars uh, that may be that that'll be the beginning, and then it's ab it's it's about scaling. And we're working with a number of partners right now. Do you right think now. the regulation on flying cars? I've heard some proponents of it argue that it might be easier than it has been on 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 driverless cars because driverless cars you have to deal with existing ro existing roads, existing everything. Flying cars essentially you're going into unconquered space. I think that. Um, Mayors that are forward-thinking understand that uh, traffic and, po and pollution are a real issue, uh, and I think flying cars can be a significant solution to traffic issues in, in cities. And, and, and these cars, to start with, they're going to be very specific. They'll, they'll be kind of highways in the air. There'll be very specific routes that these flying cars go on. They're not going to be able to take you to your backyard and land in your backyard. Uh, there'll be these skyports. So there'll be very specific routes that you go on. Uh, and I think if you build a regulatory framework that has that kind of structure around it, I think you get to uh, a better solve. Can I drag you back somewhat reluctantly back to the, the real world? But you, you have Rajiv Misra, who came in with you from SoftBank. Yes. He's going to become a direct director. Last week, he said that Uber should focus on repairing its market share in the U US and on key European markets rather than going 
over to going to new ones. Do, do you agree with that? Is that the way you look at Uber? I think one of one of the fundamental strengths of Uber is the global scope that we have. This you, is the you brand. You had that photo every, everywhere. What's it? Everywhere for everyone. Yeah, everywhere you, for everyone. You want to make it some places for some people? No, we, we like the everywhere for, for everyone. It's much sexier than some places for some people. <laughs> telling, That's telling me. just not interesting. <laughs> um, I, I do think seriously, though, the, the global scope that, that our company brings uh, is, is important, our being able to build technology that we can amortize uh, essentially everywhere in the world is hard, but it is part of the fundamental value that, that we introduce. So I would look at Uber very much as a global brand. That said, we're going to look at all opportunities, but at this point we are um, leaning forward in 2018 for us is going to be a very much a lean forward year for the company. But, but without, I'm not trying to create new boardroom tension at, at, at Uber, but that would appear that SoftBank is keener on a more limited idea, whilst you're keener on an, on every, everywhere for everyone. Well, listen, SoftBank is a is a very important shareholder. They're a larger shareholder, uh, and and many of our shareholders have opinions over what's the right thing to do. Ultimately, the governance of the company is going to be at the board, mm. uh, and we'll have those discussions at the board, and we'll set our long-term strategy, uh, and then execute on it. One of the things which Uber played, perhaps not very um, um, fortunately, a role in was the whole sexual harassment questions and everything to do with that. I suppose two, one very obvious question, do you think that you have solved that part of the culture? But secondly, do you think that, that is, this time this is a real revolution and it's going to stick? Um, I think that what was happening at, at Uber was serious, and, and I think that while uh, what Uber went through what was difficult, I think the Susan Fowler blog uh, was probably one of the best things that happened for Uber, and it certainly started a movement that's, that's an incredibly important uh, movement of the company. Um, I, I'd be reticent to say that we, it's solved. Yeah, but but it's not an endemic issue within the culture of the company, and I think the company has has learned, and I think the company took very harsh and appropriate steps to make sure that that kind of behavior is absolutely clear that that kind of behavior is not accepted in any way, shape, or form of the company, regardless of where you are, regardless of if you're a great performer or not. So I I think we're at the right place. Uh, for Uber as, as a company, but I think in general, we're not where we need to be in terms of women in senior positions, uh, making sure that we're welcoming of women in technology, uh, and, and we help women really build their careers within our company. There's a great kind of bottoms-up energy there, uh, but we're not where we need to be, and we have a lot of work ahead of us. On the issue of, um, you talked about the top performers, is that is that looking back, and also I suppose looking forward for many of the people in this room, because there are a lot of people's businesses which have been affected by this. If you had to give lessons to other people who are now looking at this issue perhaps more seriously than they have done before, is, is the really bad issue, and I suppose I'm thinking some ways about the media industry in this, is that giving top performers more room for maneuver or whatever than people or more, more discretion than people thought, is that top performers need to be treated the same as everybody else? Uh, I, I think they absolutely need to be held accountable. One of, one of the really valuable lessons that, that, that I got early in my life was actually through Jack Welch, and, and he said, you know, it's very tempting to, um, to allow top performers to misbehave in any way, but, but for me, he was talking about being aligned with the CEO. So, sometimes you allow top performers the tendency is, well, let them get away with some kind of behavior that is not the right behavior because they're so good. And what Jack told me very early on is that it's the top performers who are problematic culturally that are the most dangerous because they have followership within the company because people look up to them. So, so he's like the dumb person who is bad culturally. He's not the problem because everyone says, well, that's a dumb person, so who cares? It's the smart person who has followership, so it is incredibly important for the top performers to actually be held to account uh, more radically than anyone else because they're the ones who have followership at the company, and they have to set the example. So for me personally, that has absolutely guided uh, how I've managed. Expedia was a company that had you know, excellent cultural values, and one of the first things we did at Uber was to go out 
and reset our, our cultural values, and we call them norms because to me, it's not just these values that you put on the wall and kind of people stare at and, and you know, it's all nice. It's about behavior. And we set out to change behavior at Uber, and I think that the company was thirsting for it, uh, and we are starting on a path, and I believe it's going to be a positive path. An inevitable question. I hope you won't regard it as a cheap shot, but the, you talked about smart people who have followers throughout the company. I mean, Travis would seem to be the epitome of that sort of figure. Is that, do, you, do you think of him as being in that category of people that Jack Welch was talking about? I think, listen, Travis was the CEO of the company, and he had incredible followership. Uh, and, and he was held to account, right? I mean, he's, he's no longer the CEO of, of the company. Uh, and, and he's a board member. He's a, he's a big investor. Uh, and so he's absolutely going to play a part on, on the board. But we've also been very clear as a company that we do have to make a break with the past, with how we behaved as a company, uh, and to some extent with, with the new CEO being a very different kind of a CEO. Uh, so in the end, you have to be held accountable, and I think that Travis was held accountable, and at this point, he's a board member and a constructive one at that. If you look around the world now, do you see, where do you see the next competitors to Uber? You've obviously got Lyft breathing down your neck. Yes, so yes. Where, where else do they come from? Well, I think that um, as you move into a world of autonomy, um, the position of the car manufacturers, yeah. the position of, for example, Google, who's developing Waymo uh, and Waymo autonomous technology, um, you're going to get a lot of players interested in this space. And a lot of people think about Uber and ride sharing as a, as a significant enterprise, and it, is, and it is. But the fact is that we account for less than 1% of miles driven on the road now. When autonomy comes in, that number over the next 10 years is going to be closer, I believe, to 15 to 20 percent. So, because we're not yet a true alternative to car ownership, mm -hmm. and I believe that as you bring autonomous and you bring the price of mobility down and make it available to everybody everywhere, uh, then we become a real alternative to car ownership, and that really opens up the market for us, but it also opens us, us up to many more competitors. And is Google at the forefront of those competitors at the moment? Google is one of many. Uh, I think that they've developed very strong autonomous technology. Uh, but what we think, which is exceptional, is having autonomous technology and the network mm -hmm. under one roof, which allows us to use autonomous in a very practical way, uh, nearer than you think. <laughs>
up 1.1% on the S&P. The Dow is up 208 points, up 8 tenths of 1%. NASDAQ up 178, up by 1.7%. Jason mentioned those dip buyers coming into the market. That is tempering concern over a cloudy outlook for a U.S. stimulus package. Tech shares are rallying among some of the tech names gaining right now. Apple up 2.9%. Tesla now up by 4.1%. Microsoft up 1.9%. And Facebook up by 1.4%. Ten-year yield 0.65%. Gold is down one-tenth of 1%. 18.65 the ounce. And West Texas Intermediate crude down two-tenths of 1%. 40.22 a barrel. Again, recapping equities higher. Friday rally underway with the S&P up 34, up 1.1%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thanks so much. We will be checking in with you throughout the afternoon, mm -hmm. keeping track of what's going on in the markets and the business headlines. Let's set the Business Week agenda now, because as we try and unpack some of what Charlie was just talking about, we got to understand what traders are thinking and some of the contours of this market. Got the perfect team assembled. Vincent Signorella, global macro strategist for Bloomberg. He joins us on the phone from White Plains. And Dave Wilson, our stocks editor, author of the chart and the stock of the day. He joins us from the great state of New Jersey. Vince, I want to start with you because as I look at the Bloomberg and try and parse this out a little bit, I take what Charlie said about what's going on in the week, year to date, S&P looking flattish. But I go back, I use my Bloomberg, percent change from a year ago, NASDAQ up 34, almost 35 percent, S&P up 10 percent, even the Dow is up marginally over 12 months. What's the mindset of a trader right now? Well, I mean, traders really are trying to juggle the three big things that are going on. And one of them, uh, one of those things was, was taken away yesterday, the divisive uh, presidential election. They feel pretty good now that McConnell and the Republicans are going to stand up for the results of the election mm. should the president lose and not have that situation where we would have a, a, a not transfer of power, if you will, for the first time ever in this country. Uh, the two things that do still loom are the virus uh, rebound mm -hmm. and, of course, the stimulus. And when you look at the two, they're more concerned about the stimulus than the rebound and the virus, as long as it doesn't bring another lockdown. They feel that the economy can handle a second virus as long as it's not a real big breakout and that it's sort of contained. Um, but the lack of stimulus will absolutely disrupt the markets. And without that money, if you look at real income, if you look at the food prices, if you look at CPI, you have the two things working against consumers, higher prices, lower, lower earnings. And that combined combination, if it isn't fixed, uh, is going to make the fourth quarter an ugly one. You're not going to have that V-shaped recovery if consumers aren't spending money. You know, I did a discussion with CEOs earlier today, uh, Danny Blanchflower, who's going to be one of our guests later on, he was on it, and he said every answer to almost every question, you can start with, it depends, you know, in terms of how things are going to be. Well, it depends. Do we get stimulus? Do we have a vaccine? Do we have this? Do we have that? I mean, that's, you know, kind of where we are. Yeah, and, and the stimulus, you know, uh, people were uh, engaged because they were going to start talking again. Yeah. Um, they were even farther apart now than they were before because the bill that Pelosi is asking the Democrats to put together is $2.4 trillion. They've already rejected the Republicans, that is, $2.2. So hard to believe they're going to compromise and say, oh, 2.4 is better when 2.2 didn't work. Right. So I, 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 that doesn't feel like I'm, as a, that doesn't worry me as a surprise over this weekend that something's going to happen. I hope I'm proven wrong, but it just doesn't seem to be the case. And folks like Danny Blanchflower think you need millions and millions and millions more. You need to really make a difference. Yeah. Dave, come on in. Uh, talk to us about the trade today. Well, it really looks like one of those days when the big tech companies are leading the way. Go through the 11 main industry groups in the S&P 500. You see technologies at the forefront of the game. Uh, you look at the uh, big tech that isn't in that group. Uh, you know, Facebook, Google's owner Alphabet, Amazon, they're all higher. And actually, the only group that's down on the day is energy. So, uh, you know, that's certainly uh, an area of the market that's been weak for a while. You know, what jumped out there, I mean, just looking at ExxonMobil, someone was pointing out, Exxon's been down, and it's actually up today, which is interesting. It was down 18 out of 19 days, or it would be if it was lower today. 
I mean, you haven't seen a streak like that in seven years. So it just goes to show you how badly those shares are being beaten up. So give us a quick uh, tease for the chart of the day, Dave Wilson. All right. Well, here's the thing. If uh, you were looking at a couple of indicators, you might have known that U.S. stocks had peaked before the indexes actually showed it. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, good tease. Hey, hey, and listen, Vince, just real quickly, you had a great thing about mm -hmm. consumers. We know they're so important to the economy. Man, if we don't get stimulus, a bunch of consumers are going to not st not spend anymore. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, no people have been talking about the savings rate being elevated, but, you know, we, we, economists will tell you traditionally a temporary tax cut or this similar type of thing, which is stimulus, people save. Um, they don't spend because they know it's going away. Yeah. And in this situation, you know, that savings rate will, as Powell said earlier, is going to decline and decline and decline if further income isn't coming because they're going to need to use that, obviously, to, to feed themselves. Yeah. All right, Vincent Signorella, we always appreciate it, keeping us honest about everything that's being said on the street. I hope you have a nice tequila, scotch, gin, whatever is on the <laughs> menu for you there uh, in White Plains this afternoon as we get toward. Or perhaps toward, uh, all of the above. All of the above. It's been that kind of week. Global macro we strategist you, for Bloomberg. On the phone from White Plains, a contributor to the Macro Squawk Desk. That's real-time curated news. Audio streamed directly through your terminal. Check it out. It's Squawko on your launchpad. Our thanks as well to Dave Wilson, stock yeah. senator from Bloomberg. He'll be back with that chart of the day. So I feel like we've got a mix of the old and the new today. We're going to talk real estate. Real estate's been around forever. Labor economics. And then we're going to talk some satellites. And we've got this really cool musician. I was watching something um, on YouTube. Uh, he's figuring out how to really monetize content creation for others. He is a cool guy. He's somebody that we want to sit down with with a bottle of tequila. There you go. <laughs> you know, it's great that all your YouTube watching. Or, or some watching, iced tea, whatever, yeah, exactly. whatever floats your boat. Tea. Um, it's good that all, you know, the, your YouTubing is finally coming in handy. <laughs> I know that you're just constantly like, like the kids are doing these days, just watching the YouTube videos, the TikTok, all of it. That's hey, just we're you. on YouTube. Why not? I should love That's YouTube. That's true. You should be looking at we're YouTube. We're on YouTube right now. Yeah. All right. Let's do the Bloomberg Business Week bite of the day. I really like this one, Carol. It's one number yeah. that tells us a lot. Today's number, $316 million. It's a bit of a call back to a story that we were talking about a little bit earlier this week. A bet on magic mushrooms made one investor, that's right, $316 million richer. Christian Angermeyer spent years convincing skeptical investors of the promise of psychedelic substances to treat mental illness. His efforts paid off this week to the tune of $316 million. That's how much the 42-year-old's stake of about 22% in Compass Pathways is worth. The company's shares more than doubled in the days following its IPO on September 18th. And no, folks, we are not taking mushrooms right now and telling you that. That is the truth. It w did that need to be said? Well, Have it's we pretty wild. Anything? No, I'm just saying that's pretty oh, wild. Oh, I see what you're saying. Come uh, on, keep up. Come on, keep up. Oh, keep okay. Up. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I do need to expand my consciousness. Or just get some sleep. I'm or just worried. get some sleep. All right, let's get to Nancy Lyon. She's got World of National Headlines. Hey, Nance. Hey, Jason. The late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is breaking one last barrier. Today, she makes history again as the first woman and the first Jewish woman to lie in state. Today, we stand in sorrow, and tomorrow, we the people must carry on Justice Ginsburg's legacy. Rabbi Lauren Hultzblatt speaking at this morning's ceremony at the U.S. Capitol. Ginsburg was a fan of opera, so it was fitting opera singer Denise Graves sang the American anthem. President Trump says tomorrow he'll announce his nominee to replace Ginsburg. There is still anger on the streets of Louisville, Kentucky, after a second night of demonstrations in the city. The protests began after a grand jury decided not to indict three Louisville police officers for the March shooting death of Breonna Taylor during a no-knock raid. Today, her family held a news conference with attorney Ben Crump, announcing a request of the attorney general concerning the grand jury. If you did everything that you could do on Breonna's behalf, you shouldn't have any problem whatsoever, Daniel Cameron, to releasing the transcript 
Also today, the man accused of shooting two police officers in Louisville during the protest entered a not guilty plea in court. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries, I'm Nancy Lyons. All right, Nancy, thank you so much. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Well, crack out the sweaters, maybe the winter coats, maybe, you know, the warmest thing you got because all year round you can eat outside in New York City coming up. I got to say, I remember being in London a few years ago and it was cold outside, but they had those nice little heater things and we just had a nice little jacket and it was kind of sweet. And I, I, this is what they've got to do. This is yeah. what they've got to do because they cannot survive by, you know, that small percentage where, what is it, indoor dining rooms, 25% capacity. That's not enough to keep a business going. We know, we've talked to so many folks yeah. of, of really successful restaurants and how the margins are so slim. Well, there's a great story uh, by Kate yes. Crater today about Daniel Ballou. I mean, he's mm -hmm. basically going to, I would say, non-traditional sources of revenue, essentially getting sponsorship for the restaurant uh, in order to, to survive. I mean, this outdoor dining thing makes sense. And the reality is, is that as much as I am the biggest complainer about the cold weather in New York of anyone I know, um, and yet your wife, your wife must laugh at you because right she's from upstate she knows cold weather she is but she hates the cold weather too oh, okay um she complains about it as much as i do maybe <laughs> okay. not quite as much because i'm a huge complainer about it <laughs> but uh the reality is is that we do get some nice days you know every now and again we had a warm summer, warm winter last year yeah we had a warm winter last year. so aside from those like super cold days and if the sun is out like you can deal with it put on a few layers layer yeah. it works yeah. and maybe and they maybe they create more of those tense kind of thing or so, like i mean i, I don't you know if it's yeah, of snowing course, then out. you sort of have to walk a line between <laughs> like are you essentially just creating an outdoor room and kind of defeating the purpose of eating Correct. outside you know Correct. what i mean so Correct. uh it'll be interesting to see what people come up with but you know the mayor of new york city uh, bill de blasio making this happen and it makes sense uh, we got to try whatever we can to tamp down the virus but also keep the economy going as much as we can and a lot of these restaurants as you say they are on the razor's edge it's an industry that generates nearly $900 billion annually in the U.S., so it's an important one, certainly, to the U.S. economy. And we've got to get those workers back to work. This is Bloomberg.
stories, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Stocks continue to push higher. Best level of the day right now, 38-point gain in the S&P 500 index. Let me give you the numbers first. I'll tell you why in a moment. The Dow up 237, up 9 tenths of 1%. S&P, by the way, up 1.2%. NASDAQ up 191, up 1. 1.8%. NASDAQ 100 index up 1.8%. Dow Transports up 1.4%. Ten-year yield 0.66%, down one thirty-second. Gold down one-tenth of 1%, 18.66 the ounce. And West Texas Intermediate Crude lower, little change, down one-tenth of 1%, 40 28 a barrel. Stocks are higher as dip buyers appeared after the market slide, tempering concern over a cloudy outlook for U.S. Uh, US stimulus package. S&P 500 index now at session highs. NASDAQ 100 outperforming with gains in tech shares, including Tesla and Apple. Tesla up now by 4%, Apple up by 3%. Recapping an equity rally on the way underway on this Friday. S&P up 39, up 1.2%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Well, let's do our Friday check-in with yes, Dr. Ian Lusbader, Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine over at NYU's Langone Medical Center, joining us as he does on the phone from New York City. So, you know, it's interesting, Ian, because I feel like every day, maybe not quite as much as you, but every day, Carol and I individually and together are having conversations with people about the virus, how it's playing through society, how it's playing through schools, work from home, work from the office, all of those things, progress with vaccines. We look to you to separate the signal from the noise, as they say. What's the most important thing you heard this week when it comes to the virus? Hi, guys. Happy Friday. Shana Tava to uh, some of our listeners, and uh, hopefully... All, all is well with uh, with you folks. No, no monkeys here. No, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Isn't that, we'll is that just the office? Maybe there are a few uh, yeah. hiding. Is that crazy? Come on, we hear about traffic stuff. You know, Ian. Don't, I don't think I've ever heard that. Don't try this at home. It's only yeah. for professionals. I agree. <laughs> so, um, you know, always interesting news on uh, on COVID, and um, I think the most interesting story that that I heard this week was about. Um, some airlines testing yeah. uh, point of care, which is a saliva test. And I today just had uh, a patient from uh, one of our universities, and they're all, all the professors and, and many of the students are getting these saliva tests before returning to class, which makes a lot of sense. And what the airlines are doing, or some of them, is testing um, the travelers uh, before they get on at these point of care uh, 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 departures tests, you know, that come back in, in a few minutes. And I think that's very reassuring to other travelers that uh, everyone is negative before they get on board for a 9 or 10 or 11 hour flight. And it's similar to what we do at the hospital before procedures, surgeries, pulmonary function tests, stress tests. We do something more invasive, the nasal swab, but, and that turns around in 24 hours. So I think what we're trying to do is to reassure people that the other people they're with are safe, and I think that that's an interesting development. Why aren't we all, why aren't they just using saliva tests all the time? It sounds like if they're, it's easier, it's quicker. Is it as, um, you know, um, it's fairly accurate. Accurate, thank you. The <laughs> and specificity is fairly accurate. Um, and I think as data, you know, comes through, it, it's looking similar mm. uh, to the nasal swabs, the PCR tests. They're, they're different tests. One is an antigen test. The other um, is a polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, that amplifies the amount. Now, there can be false positives and false negatives. We certainly can see some people who've had COVID who've recovered, and when you do their nasal swab, their PCR test is positive. It's not active virus, but the, the RNA is still there and magnified. So sometimes you can get, uh, you know, data that's really not helpful. But this point of care or the antigen or saliva test, I agree with you, should really be done more widespread. And I think that would reassure people. We're seeing that in schools and colleges. Yeah. Many of the kids now are getting a once or twice a week even a saliva test. And this way you can identify uh, an early case and kind of isolate that group or that floor. 
I mean, could we have a setup, Ian? You know, we're basically like before Jason and I went to work. Like you just quick did that, and then once it's okay, you can go into the office. I mean, do we have enough of those tests? Can we can we operate like that? I think that would be the goal, and, okay. and I think uh, we need to sort of uh, step away from, you know, sort of the, you know, political or demonstrations and cops and all of that, and focus some resources on getting a lot of those point of care tests because I think many offices and businesses can really reopen and schools can more comfortably reopen if we do that on a periodic basis. Uh, you know, obviously there's some cost involved, but I think if we can ramp that up, people would, until the vaccine arrives, and we do think that's probably January, February, and, you know, again, that's going to be staged. We can talk about that. But I think until that comes around, these point-of-care uh, tests make sense, and I'm glad the airlines are doing that. And yeah. I, I, certainly me getting on a plane, I would, I'm happy to do it, and I'd feel happier if everyone Agreed. on board is also negative. Agreed. Yeah, yeah, agree with that uh, for sure. I mean, I do wonder, Ian, you know, as we think about going back to school and what we've learned so far from both the colleges and from the secondary schools, it's uneven when it comes to learning. Let's set that aside for a second. But as you've monitored the various sort of outbreaks in college towns and, and things like that, what do you take away from that? Well, we do have some data that um, there's an, a, a big increase in COVID in young people in, in their 20s. Um, and really the demographics uh, in Europe and elsewhere have, have shifted mm -hmm. from the sick people and more people at an older age to now a bigger reservoir in younger people, uh, probably due to you know less social distancing and masks and socializing and that sort of thing. You know, the good news for them is that uh, they really do tend to do a lot better. There are really very few young children um, who have been severely affected by this. Of the 200,000, you know, dead, we're, we're talking, you know, uh, perhaps a, a, a hundred kids uh, affected. So it, it seems to be much better tolerated. Unfortunately, they have fewer symptoms and can infect older right. people who are more vulnerable. Yeah. That's the rationale for m more testing right. of this sort of point of care testing, where where you don't have to sit down and have a nurse stick a swab down your uh, in your nose. Right, right. This right. is I'm getting ready to take my first COVID test on Monday, so I'm a little like I don't know whether it's saliva or. Uh, nasal swab. Um, we're right. going to come back with Dr. Ian Law Spader, Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine at NYU Lanco Medical Center on the phone in New York. I want to ask him, Jason, about what is the most read story on the Bloomberg Terminal all day that has to do with COVID and a new treatment. So we'll get into that in just a moment right here on Bloomberg.
Broadcasting live to New York, Bloomberg 1130. To Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 991. To Boston, Bloomberg 1061. To San Francisco, Bloomberg 960. To the country, Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business app and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Coming up, we are going to continue our conversation with Ian Lesmater. Our go-to doc is Carol Teased. As we were wrapping up the first part of the conversation, we got to talk about the most read story of the day. Yeah, it, it deals with uh, interferons. So I want to ask him uh, if this is kind of the key to treating certainly some of those really ill COVID-19 patients. All right, let's get back to your top business stories and another check with Charlie Pallet. Hey, Charlie. Hi, thank you very much. Happy Friday to you both. Uh, we've got the bulls in a happy mood on this Friday. Going to be a losing week. Uh, right now, though, the S&P advancing 1.2% best level of the day once again, up by about 40 points. The Dow up 253, higher by 1%. NASDAQ up 189, up 1.8%. Ten-year yield, 0.66%. Gold is down two-tenths of 1%. 1865 the ounce. And crude, West Texas Intermediate Crude, uh, right now 40.23 a barrel, down two-tenths of 1%. Stocks are advancing as dip buyers appeared after the market slide, tempering concern over a cloudy outlook for a U.S. stimulus package. We have got Apple and Tesla jumping. Apple shares up now by 3%. Tesla, a among the other tech names, up today by 3.7%. One area of investigation for medical researchers is so-called asymptomatic carriers of COVID. Dr. Andrew Pekosh is a professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He was interviewed this morning on Bloomberg Television. This virus causes um, a significant amount of people to have infections that don't provide very strong symptoms, and some of the estimates can be anywhere from 20 to even 40% of infections can be asymptomatic, meaning you don't have those standard coughs and sneezes and fevers that are associated with an infection. But those people can be capable of transmitting the virus to others. The Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health is supported by Michael R. Bloomberg, founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Again, recapping equities pushing higher. S&P up 39 right now, up 1.2%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, we want to get back to uh, our guest at this hour, Dr. Ian Lusbader. He's a clinical associate professor of medicine at NYU Langone Medical Center. He is still with us on the phone in New York City. So, Dr. Lusbader, let me ask you about it. It is truly our most read story on the Bloomberg in the past eight hours. This is what folks have been reading, and it talks about um, the loss of an immune function for some uh, COVID-19 patients, and they're talking about mm -hmm. the lack of a, of a substance called interferon that apparently, I guess, helps orchestrate the body's defense against viral pathogens. So talk to me a little bit about this. Like, how significant is this, and what might this mean in terms of treating patients that come down with the virus? You know, I think it has potentially uh, a very positive news. You know, interferons are a, a normal uh, mammal cell response to uh, infections, typically viral infections. And we've known about it for decades, and, and we've used interferons for a variety of diseases, including hepatitis B and hepatitis C. We have much more effective antivirals, and interferons are used for a variety of other kinds of autoimmune and immunologic uh, diseases. And we certainly know that, that they have antiviral uh, properties, prevent viral replication. And for most people who have the flu, that kind of fever and muscle aches that you feel are really related, you know, it's, it, it's in a good way to interferon response. It's the body's natural response, and it does work in a variety of ways, and there are many different kinds of interferon. Um, and so it makes sense that interferon might be helpful with, with this virus. You know, widespread studies uh, should be done. Generally, it's a safe medication and certainly may be helpful as part of a cocktail, uh, perhaps including remdesivir or steroids. And, you know, we have yet to figure out sort of the ideal treatment early on and, uh, you know, identify that subset of patients. But I think it's very encouraging and very exciting. Uh, it's certainly not standard therapy at this point, but certainly studies should be done while we're waiting for vaccines and more definitive therapy, and I think it makes a lot of sense. I do want to say this argues for uh, having um, uh, an electronic record, a national universal healthcare record because part of the problem is gathering all of this data, whether it's reporting data, you have all of these smaller systems 
and it takes time for the government to gather the data. Had we had one universal health care system, you'd be able to get this data. You'd be able to do studies more easily and really be more on top of the information. Obviously, there's some, you know, we have to be careful with security and so forth, but right. uh, that's a bit of a tangent. It's my plug for us thinking about a universal, you know, health care record, but certainly something like um, interferon really does have uh, potential, uh, but it has to be studied in this subset. We know it works in many viruses. How well will it work for uh, for this virus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, we have to see. You know, one thing, Ian, I was thinking about uh, when we were talking about the, the rapid testing that I wanted to go back to, I read something, and, and I think we treat you as a little bit of a myth buster. Uh, you, as we <laughs> often is. said, you, you're, you're our go-to guy. I've I read a couple like things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, yeah, you could wear like one of those berets. Um, I do. I have read a couple things that basically say, you know what, taking your temperature before you go to school or go into the office, like that's kind of. I mean, it, it works to an extent, but really isn't that great an indicator. What do you make of that? I agree completely. You know, a lot of what we do in life makes us feel better, but doesn't really make a difference. Um, so certainly people could take Tylenol before they go to school, uh, or they may have a very low-grade temperature, or they – it is one test. It's, it is the easiest thing to do to squeeze a thermometer, you know, a, a remote thermometer at someone as they come in.